So, welcome to the Microsoft EMS podcast. Oh. And today we have a few faces, faces that we've probably always seen before. We have James. Hey, James. Hello. Hello. You don't need an introduction. Have Eric. Me. I've been here enough. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Eric. A few words, Eric. Uh, no, just, just glad to be here. Curious to uh, see what our, our special guest has to, to talk about today. Yeah, well, yeah. it's going to be last. <laughs> and then we have Samesh. Hey, Samesh. Hi. Hi. Yep. So today here to learn more about Android ID and from Jeff. Yep. That's yeah. awesome. And I, I know, Samesh, you've been, you've been really active on your, you're always active on Mac OS management. I know you're here <laughs> yeah, to talk about Intra. That's 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 cool. Yeah. Baskies. Yes, oh, there we, we go. Yeah. <laughs> We're happy to talk Mac now too. So I have one sitting yeah. right here. Yeah. And as as always, we've got Yanis. Hi, Yanis. Oh yeah. Hey. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Well, uh, yeah. Over to you and over to Jeff, I guess. You go so, ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks everybody for having me. So for those who me I have not met before. I'm Jeff Kazmer. I'm a principal product manager in Microsoft Security. And in particular, I'm part of our CXE organization. What that is is customer experience engineering. So I work with customers, large customers, small customers, all customers on understanding identity uh, scenarios, capabilities, and helping them either deploy them or if there's challenges in the products, I can bring those back into engineering and see what we can bring to enhance our platform for customers. And we can already tell that that you've been doing this before. You've been speaking before. <laughs> you're you're an expert on this, uh, and I and I know that you've been doing your 425 show. I think it's called. Uh, you have a special name for it, right? You say it in a special way, but the uh, 45 show. Yes, 45 show. Yeah, and that is from the area code uh, where Redmond is. So that is where the name came from. Got it. And I know that you are here today to talk about IGA. And can you can you tell me a little bit of how long you've been working with IGA? Sure. Those who... So before I joined Microsoft, so I've been at Microsoft about 12 years now, but I've been in the industry for almost 30 years at some point in various roles from uh, large enterprises consulting. But I've always gravitated towards um, directory services, uh, identity governance, really it's access management. So. You know, as a customer of Microsoft, I deployed IGA solutions. Then I became a consultant deploying IGA solutions. And then I moved into engineering, uh, building uh, IGA solutions for Microsoft. So I've had a, a, a very active career that's always centered on IGA in some capacity. Run so is that saying that you, uh, you are familiar with ILM and FIM and MIM? And yes. <laughs> so uh, very much so. So in the early days, how I actually got started with it was I was at a large company who uh, we were doing a um, acquisition, right? And a divestor at the same time. And we were utilizing at the time was MIS to do a aggregation into an Atom directory for um, integrations, right? And I said, wait a minute, we can do synchronization. And I said, for identity data, what else can I use this for? And I actually helped build a whole identity program on uh, provisioning from HR, um, correlation IDs um, at a global scale, right? Utilizing MIS, ILM, FIM, MIM, all those uh, components. And uh, for those who are FIM, MIM aware, you may be something, something called the WALL, the Workflow Activity Library. Um, this actually was co-developed with my team uh, as a customer and MCS that later became something what we turned into an open source project. So if you're a MIM person, um, you know, I'm happy to say that you probably may have used that. Cool. My, my uh, only knowledge of, of FIM was that it was the uh, heftier, bigger brother of what then became AD Sync, right? In the early days, yeah. So yeah. when when in the BPOS DirSync world, that was a modified version yeah. of that, and then it became AD Connect became its own. Yeah, that's a while ago. <laughs> but since then, <laughs> I, I've transitioned from on-prem identity, right, from AD to cloud-based identity, right. So you know, as 
as the industry has moved towards cloud, my career went more towards cloud. And that's how I ended up joining or getting on the, at the time, the Azure Active Directory engineering team, now Entra team. And, and, and I also see that now we have, now we just talked about AD Connect. We also have, now we have the Cloud Sync agent is called today. So now you're flipping the switch, right? Well, so Cloud Sync today is still meant for hybrid, right? So today we take uh, your on-premises identity, we call it the source of authority where you're managing or provisioning that, and we project or synchronize it to Entra to utilize it in the cloud. Cloud Sync is that lightweight version of the Azure AD Connect Sync server. It's an agent base where we manage the configuration from the cloud, but we're still bringing users from on-prem to bring them to the cloud, except we recently announced one of the first kind of uh, scenarios, what we call right back. So now you don't have to create groups on on-prem, sync them to the cloud. You actually can create all your groups in the cloud and selectively write them back on-prem. Because as more organizations' workloads move from on-prem to the cloud, it doesn't make sense to still create groups on-prem. Start creating in the cloud where you're consuming them. Just um, my space is within Intune um, and not specifically with uh, uh, within the kind of identity space, although, you know, it's all interlinked, right? But what what are the use cases for um, writing them back it down is. to on-prem uh, at all? Like if you're, if you're kind of managing them in the cloud, uh, I'm guessing for integrations that you might still have within your on-prem systems, is that... And I can say out the bat that James, he doesn't like hybrid as a yeah. joint machines. Oh, uh, yeah, but that's, that's about, that's a device thing. Like we <laughs> okay, all know okay. that, that like hybrid. <laughs> well, we, we agree. <laughs> we agree. Hybrid join is where you want to move from. You want to move to pure yeah. entry join. So I'm a full agreement there. And there's many reasons from an identity space, why it's a benefit for the organization, but also end users. I could talk a lot about that, but your question around the group right back, right? I was very careful to say as needed, meaning if I'm only consuming access to a resource on-prem, write back the group on-prem. But if you're not using it on-prem, why, why write it back, right? Most organizations aren't going towards on-prem. They're going from on-prem to hybrid to full cloud, right? So start moving that point of management into the cloud and write back what we call reach back um, as necessary. Cool. Yeah, well, the MAMP tunnel would be an example for using these groups. For example, if I need to access resources to on-prem and I'm using the tunnel thing for this. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, if there is something that is utilizing the mm -hmm. ACL on-prem, that needs to reference the group on-prem, you're going to write, you want to write it back. But the more and more workloads um, that started on-prem, like, you know, you talked about tunnel, Azure AD app proxy or Entra ID app proxy. Now, these are all conduits for workloads on-prem. And now with our new SSE capability, we also have the ability to access workloads on-prem. But as those workloads are moving from on-prem to the cloud, move that point of management with it. And, and that makes all sense in, in a way that we now have to focus on our Entra ID and make the connection to our, our on-premise environments. And then it then it comes directly or naturally over to how do you then do the governance in Intra? Correct. So today, most organizations are utilizing groups. Groups have been around, um, or most large organizations, I should say, are utilizing groups because they've been around in the NT world, the AD world, and they exist in the Intra world. So it's like easy, a natural progression of this, right? So we've taken the ability, like I said, to move the point of management from on-prem to the cloud. So today, you can create all new groups, security groups in Entra. You can selectively write them back on-prem. And we have documentation on how we recommend nesting those groups into your on-premises groups. So now, when I manage the, the membership in the cloud, the mm -hmm. assignments in the cloud using modern governance, they can be synchronized back and consumed on-prem seamlessly, right? Using things like Kerberos in the, the group um, is contained in the pack, right? But customers are also looking to say, well, I have existing groups. I want to take my existing group and move it to the cloud and change that source of authority so I can manage it, the existing group on in the cloud. That is something we're looking at in the future. But today you can start creating all new groups in the cloud and only write back on-prem as needed. Now, if you want to start moving away from groups, so groups have some benefits, right? Groups are um, well-known, easy constructs. We understand how these work. 
on prem, you have this concept of nesting groups in the cloud or an entra. You really don't utilize nesting groups, right? So if anybody has ever done access assignment to applications in entra, you know that it's a flat groups only, right? So, and we enable capabilities like the ability to have dynamic groups where you can compute the membership on the member of other groups. But again, we're still using groups, right? Now, one of the challenges with groups is they work well for assigning access you want, but they could also be assigned to other resources that you didn't intend for. So may, you may create a group called the, uh, you know, the cat fancy uh, photo share <laughs> group. That's a great little, little collaboration. And somebody actually puts that on the SharePoint uh, trade secrets mm. site, right? So now, right, when I'm assigning access to what I thought the resource behind the group, may I, don't, I may not know the full visibility of that. And that's where you start seeing things like evolving how we're managing access assignments in the cloud to resources in a modern way. And I know, Jeff, that we talked about it a little bit earlier and before we started the, the show. And we talked about if you wanted to show us something. So do you want to show us something inside the portal and how you get, sure. get started with doing the, the intro IGA? Yeah, perfectly. So one of the key things is that we really focus on when Entra Identity Governance. So this is something we recently announced uh, last year, right? It's a very popular uh, feature set that customers really want to know more about. So let me show you some of the capabilities that we actually have. When I say modern, what do I really mean by and that? And I can already tell that so well, while Jeff, he, he finds his screen to that, that I he asked if he, can, if he could show a demo. And I'm like, I'm amazed that he can do it for five minutes before we go on. He always ha has the things ready and he's, he's ready to show. That's, that's, uh, that's cool. Yeah, no problem. Like I said, I, I'm I'm always enthused to help customers understand what we what they can do because a lot of customers already have these capabilities. They just don't realize it, right? There are many times I talk to a customer and say, Oh, we've got to buy this IJ tool because you know we have groups and we have apps and all that. I'm like, you know, you have Entra today, right? Let's look at the capabilities you have and let's see which ones you can use. So I'm always happy to show. So in Entra, if you've if you've not familiar with the portal, right, we have our main screen here. We break things down by some of the core components of Entra. So, for those who don't know, Microsoft Entra is a family of identity products that kind of correlate with security, right? So, Entra ID, you formerly known as Azure AD, Entra ID Governance, which is what we're going to focus on here, but then the other things like Entra ID, sorry, Entra Permissions Management, your Kim Governance. Uh, Entra verified credentials or verified ID. So it's a suite of identity services under that uh, Entra umbrella. But most organizations, we understand that governance can be hard because they've probably been through traditional governance products. Like I said, I was a consultant. I deployed IG solutions on-prem that organizations had disparate apps trying to bring them to manage. It took months and years. And a lot of times those big projects don't really get to the results they want because of the complexities, the challenge of needing developers. And we really strive on enabling admins to bring governance without having the need for development. We want to do configuration. We want to bring insights to drive actions to help you bring governance quickly. So one of the first things we recommend is starting out with the identity governance dashboard, right? In here, as we can see activity that's happening today in your organization, right? We can see this is a lab tenant, not a lot of activity, but they're stranger to members, to guests. And I can see that there are capabilities that I could enable around governance, right? So in here, it's telling me, hey, you've created users recently. Um, you can automate that using lifecycle workflows. Every organization has lifecycle tasks. We call it the join, the move, the leave, right? Things that you're doing when somebody is pre-joining, something of day of hire, when they request access, um, when they leave the organization, the dreaded walkout scenario. Every organization does this. Automate that. Automate it so it's repeatable, auditable, and reportable, right? And then we look at things like direct user assignment, right? These are users we've directly given access to, to resources. Now, this is a challenge because this may be um, an admin went inside and Jeff to this app, but where's the, uh, the governance trail to that? How is that requested? How is it approved? We can modernize that to things like access packages, right? That bring that depth of governance controls with the ease of use of self-service, right? And policy-based. But as you can see, I can go all through these capabilities. Um, 
entitlement management really is one of the main focal points for me because this is where I see that modernization of access assignments, right? We have the ability to create what's called a package of resources that may contain things like groups. It may contain things like applications and SharePoint sites and coming soon, Entra ID roles. Now, one of the cool things here is that we actually can be very explicit in what we are assigning uh, to the application. So today, when you are giving access to an application, do you typically just create a group and then assign users to that group and assign them to the application? Yeah, that's what you did. That's what you usually do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yep, very common. And like I mentioned, once that group is assigned to the application, it could be reused for something else. And you don't have full visibility of maybe what you're actually uh, assigning. So when we get to access packages, we can define the actual app and specifically, if it exposes things like app roles, what role they have in the application, right? So now it's very explicit. I know when I assign these users to this, this uh, package, I know exactly what their resources are. I have a policy that says um, who has to review it, who has to approve, who is eligible to be assigned. And then over that, that uh, request, I can collect additional information. And one of the exciting things I think is having access that's not forever, right? So if you've been in a large organization, you acquire access and you may keep it for the life of your employment, right? And there are many ways that we can try and do, remove access when it's not appropriate. We'll use things like access reviews and that's or the, attestation. And that's something you see like in, in your tenants that you have these membership for forever in, in one way. And that membership gives you access to a resource, which is, yeah, governance is cool. And your, your roles may change. Like, uh, you know, in my career, I started out, say, in help desk. And then over time, I became an, an, a director engineer. I had more access or change access as that changed. What is defining that for me, right? So being able to define access based on policy of things like the role or metadata, and then where it's manually requested, having policies that limit the access, in this case, using expiration, right? It expires if I if I don't re-request it or extend it, or I may require review over that period. So now we're granting access where appropriate, keeping it where it's still appropriate, and removing yeah, it. So now, so now we just a little bit based on what access lifecycle management is, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and that's part of it, right? So we look at the ability to assign access at the day one, right? So the pre-hire scenario, uh, automate that access by doing things like um, utilizing HR metadata to say Jeff is in engineering, Jeff gets these access packages, which gives him access to these applications. But if Jeff changes roles, we want to automatically take that away and assign him the appropriate access, right? So we typically look at this as a user's journey. And every organization goes through this, right? We start out with a, a user who joins the organization, getting HR data into Entra is very simple. like just adding an application uh, and doing some mapping. Then we automate assignments. And now when they start day one, they have access to what their role has. But because we know not everything is, is data-driven, there's request-based. Maybe Jeff is in sales, but should he have access to the new sales project team? He can request it, and if it's approved, assign it. So, and then we can go into things like admin access. Um, you may be familiar with things like privilege identity management. Well, we brought the capability to bring that um, just-in-time access, not just for infrastructure, but for applications with things like PIM for groups now. Yeah, so I saw you you, you showed me to be just before that the end, coming soon, uh, Microsoft Intro roles. Yes, so. that is correct. So this to me is um, an exciting component of extending what we can assign. So you know, I assume you know yes. about PIM, right? And how we can assign a intro role as what we call active, right? It's permanently active. If I sign in, I'm global admin. If I sign in, uh, I'm application admin. Or they could be eligible, meaning they are they are capable of saying, when I sign in and I wanna use this role, I elevate to that role. It's time bound. When I when I no longer need that that elevation, it gets removed. So this reduces access at rest. But how do you how do you sign those those roles to people today? In 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 the organizations you work with, how does that happen? Manually, it's usually, usually very sort of static assignments though for for privilege roles. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just say a request of some sort, right? Like say, Eric, you're an admin. I'm going to request that, hey, I want to be app admin. And I may put a ticket in for your ITSM tick ticketing system. I may ping you on Slack. Hey, can you just make me an admin? And you go and do it. But where's the auditability? Where is that traceability that Jeff requested it, that Eric reviewed it, approved it, and fulfilled it, right? So I think, in my opinion, bringing the entitlement management, the ability to request access to PIM eligible roles, right? Being able to review it, um, approve it, assign it, and have the life cycle of when it should be removed from assignment, right, is the missing piece for PIM. Because now I have that complete life cycle. I can put a policy on who can request, how long, and when they have it assigned as eligible, now I use PIM to elevate and all the goodness we bring for just-in-time access. So I think it's a great example of features across Entra coming together to better secure an organization. And I think it's great that you are evolving the access packages because access packages have been here for a while. And I'm, I'm sure that many people don't even know what it is and have it, have it not in use at all. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's great to see that you are actually involving that, that product. And one of the exciting things that I, I particularly um, are excited, am excited about is the ability to bring workflows and extensibility to access packages, right? So while a package is a construct, we've put resources in there that we want to give access to. And that could be for things like SSO or provisioning, right? You can have an on-premises app that you've integrated into Entra right, that you want to manage the access yeah, and that's, to. That's the other thing I want to talk about, integration and automation, uh, automation capabilities, which is uh, a hot subject. Exactly. And we brought the ability to have custom extensions in access packages. That was kind of the first layer. So when access is assigned or, sorry, requested, approved, assigned, removed, we want to call a custom extension to go and do something. That could be open an ITSM ticket. That could be notify them on Teams or Slack. It could be assign them training records when they request access to a system. Really, whatever you want it to be is really up to what you want to integrate. And the key here is that we've built this on logic apps, not on some bespoke workflow system that you have to learn just for that product, right? This makes it something that is more manageable for admins and approachable and something that organizations we feel can support long term need to build out a, a system so when people want a uh, global admin, they can uh, use a VC to prove that they've passed their uh, SC300. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? We already have that. So that is here. So you actually can um, utilize the ability to request VCs as part of an access package request. So that's integrated into, um, let me pull up the slide real quick, uh, for onboarding access to it. So now as part of your policy, you actually can say in order to request access, you must present a VC from an issuer that I trust. And when we do that, the approver can see that you were presented the verified credential. And the best part is that we can take metadata from that VC, verified metadata, and now flow that onto the user object. So now we can use that for even deeper governance to say, well, Jeff, he's a verified admin. He can get access to global admin. But Brian, he's not. Oh, and when that when that um, VC expires, we can also remove his access. That's too. pretty slick. Yeah. So these are these are all new things. And this is why I say modernization, right? Bringing new constructs as the workloads move from on prem, the technologies we've had for years as they evolved. We had to um, modernize how we govern those resources. And these kind of things we feel bring that modern capability to the modern work with where customers are going. So you can see here, like I'm, I'm pulling a um, an example of adding a VC here. So I could, let's see, Woodgrove. Woodgrove should pop up for me. If I, oh, it's DID, if I remember correctly. Yep. So in here, I can require this VC be presented in my access request, right? So if it could be a verified employee, it could be a third-party issuer. It really depends on what you're requiring your policies. And we see um, organizations wanting to issue their own training records from their own training systems and potentially use that to say, hey, you passed your internal training. Yeah, you and, and how do you see the, the adoption in, in like overall with the verified credentials? 
so it's actually something I, I, I find more and more, right? So I think verified credentials have been in Entra for a while. And I think organizations conceptually said, well, what, what is that? And how do I use that, right? So one of the first surfaces that I was excited for was bringing it to governance, right? We brought this to governance. It came with Entra ID governance capabilities. But another top, another area that I definitely see this for is remote onboarding, mm -hmm. right? Part of that process of, uh, I hired somebody remotely, right? They're never going to come to an office. How do I verify who they are remotely to give them corporate credentials, right? So the onboarding where I may um, require that on their pre-hire, they go to an onboarding portal where they go to um, to get a request to verify credential from a third party proving their identity, right, from something you trust, and then issuing your employee VC. And then you could do things like issue your temporary access pass. So users can start out passwordless day one, right? That's a very common scenario that I see. And recently, I see VCs being used um, for help desk verification, right? So I was talking about this on X, I think, earlier this week, right? The ability that when somebody calls, how do you actually verify that's Jeff behind that phone, right? And I've seen a lot of approaches, some not so good, some okay, where I like the VC because now you have the ability for the help desk um, analyst to verify the caller by presenting the VC through a common portal. And that way you have uh, more assurance that the person behind that is the person that you're speaking to. Now, I think that... So VCs, very exciting, very new. And I think as customers learn about them, they're starting to yeah, see them I was just going to say, I think with you, you see and write a lot of the... Uh sort of social engineering attacks, starting with service desks that um, there's a lot of potential with VCs sort of, uh, you know, filling that security gap there. Yeah, it, ma it makes total sense. And now, do you know actually how to issue a VC? Today? Uh, the only thing I've been touch touched with the VC is when I go to my LinkedIn, I go, I see that this, this button that's been there forever, verify my identity, and it's used my passport. And it, because I have a U in my in my in my name, it doesn't it doesn't validate me, but I haven't connected my tenant yet. But you can that will be great to see because uh, maybe I can learn a thing or two. Yeah, so it actually is a quick start for Verify Credentials. So any Entra customer actually can go in there and say, I want to issue a verified employee VC for my organization. So in my tenant, you can see that I've already set this up. And all you need to have is one of your domains that you verified, um, filled in some information about how you yeah. present. Yeah, you I was about to say, well, here. call that out. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So this actually will per create the VC2 issue. And this is where I can define what that looks like. And it looks like a lot of, of, of complex configuration, but it really is not. We have a quick start and a more, um, how do I say, uh, configurable start. But most organizations are looking at quick start, right? Here's what the claims I can issue. And we actually enable this. So now the users can actually go to their My Account page. And actually, once you've enabled this, you can go and say, go issue my VC. So I would recommend if you haven't done the quick start, definitely give it a you know a setup in your labs. And you can see that if the tenant has it, get my verified ID. And now I can utilize that for things, like I said, that verified help desk. Maybe I want to reset my credentials by proving who I am. So it's a great foundation to start exploring as you can use it across a lot of identity services. You know, it's going to be... So you can go one step further. I'm trying to think of the name. What is the like sort of a uh, right liveness check part of uh, yes, yes, <laughs> face check. So yep. So we we actually added the capability just recently to say you have a VC, and we issued a photograph on that VC that represents the subject or person. But how do I know that you didn't just steal Jeff's phone? You you, you use your five dollar wrench to get his pin, right? And you're you're presenting that VC, right? Well, we actually have the ability to say when you're presenting the VC, we need to do a face check, and we're gonna actually do a liveliness check using your mobile device, right? Because today you can use a wallet like the Microsoft Authenticator that has a camera attached. You present your face and it's a live list check and it compares using our machine learning and AI uh, of Azure to say, is this a live person and does it match the photo that's contained in that verified credential? So now you not only have the verified credential, but the holder presenting it can also be verified for liveliness. 
you can start seeing a lot of great things where you're looking at entry capabilities are identity focused. But when you start taking features, combining them, you get real solutions that solve problems today and where things are going. So that's what we say modern identity solutions, modern capabilities. You want to get to from managing your workloads and managing your identities on prem, start moving those workloads to Entra and start moving management to get these capabilities. And that probably leads me over to what, what do you see as the future of identity governance, Jeff? So now we are, we are involved in the products now. We are oh, like perfect. connecting the dots. We are getting group right back. We are getting uh, verified credentials. We're getting everything like assembled into our access packages, identity governance. So we look at the, the, the flow I talked about earlier, right? Automation insights to drive actions, right? So getting your authoritative data, whether it's an HR data source like Workday or it's your on-premises database or spreadsheet, you can integrate those directly into Entra. And that's the foundation, right? Because now you have things to base decisions off of. Now you can say, let's automate those assignments based on that data using auto assignment packages for um, entitlement management. And then we can go to things like lifecycle workflows. Instead of having the admin that is doing those manual tasks, or maybe that scripter at the organization who automated this five years ago and then left, and nobody wants to touch the script anymore because they don't know what it does, right? You're bringing that to a common platform to automate and, and uh, report on. And then now you're enabling self-service. No longer do I have to go to an ITSM ticket to ask an admin to do things. I'm empowering the end user who wants to do something in the business today and empowering the people who are responsible for those resources to take action, be less admin centric. So move towards uh, policy-based governance and embrace user self-service that is guardrailed around policies and start exploring things like machine learning and AI because we are looking at how do we bring insights into um, uh, a, a large complex environment? How do you bring governance to it? A very common challenge that organizations have is that they focus on access reviews, right? The ability to say access that's assigned, I'm gonna say somebody's gotta review it, see if it's appropriate and remove it. They're not managing the complete life cycle from a beginning to end. Access reviews is our removal. But one of the challenges we see is that we are asking the organization, the business, to do a new job. You are now responsible to review access, right? And this could become onerous and challenging, right? So we've brought capabilities in Entry ID governance to help guide reviewers on what decisions they should make. So using AI and ML to say, hey, this user isn't active anymore. You should remove this access. Or things like this user does not match the other group members. They're an outlier. We recommend you remove this access. We want to avoid that, that burden of, oh, I have to approve it again, select all approve. Oh, I got to do it again, select all approve, right? Bringing these modern controls and modern ways to help em empower end users to use them. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I will say, like, obviously yeah, I'm passionate awesome. about this, right? And a lot of times I talk to customers and they're like, wow, I didn't know any of this existed. I didn't know you guys were doing this. I didn't know Microsoft was doing governance. So that's why I'm always happy to say, hey, you may already have these capabilities. Now, we did launch the new Entra ID governance capability because we heard from customers. We brought, IGA has been in Entra for a while. That was what we call our foundation, our basic capabilities. But we heard customers wanted more. And that's where we brought the Entra ID governance capabilities collection. And you'll find that is more on the automation, the insights, right? The scale governance, right? To get away from uh, manual tasks, to do automation and to have- and That's the thing, right? You need report. to put it in scale. You need to put it in with automation because you need to ensure that you you pretty much govern, govern your, your tenant. So it's not the manual work anymore. Yeah, and, and one of the key things here is that automation. So like you're seeing really quick, I'm showing you creating a workflow that says when new users are hired on the day of hire, I want to go do these things. And maybe I want to scope it to a certain department because I have different differences. But these are all tasks, right? These are tasks that admins are doing today. They're doing them manually. Some are doing them scripted, right? But we have a whole suite of these capabilities that you just click and configure, right? And they build that workflow that becomes repeatable. So now you're scaling that governance instead of uh, the admin manual tasks, those ITSM tickets, you're using data and automation to drive the outcomes of a more uh, secure environment. And that's one of the things that we try to say is that 
identity governance is security. You're managing access. We do focus a lot on credentials, on authentication, right? But once somebody has authenticated, what do they actually have access to? How do we manage that? And that is pure identity governance. Uh, and this is awesome, uh, Jeff. But to 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 end it a little bit, to, if we go to to the end, we have we'll be talking for forty five minutes. Time goes quick. I want to touch a little bit based on the license requirements. Is there any? Do you have any sure. resources for us to like look into and get a good overview? I do actually. So in this, when we started focusing on enter ID governance, we understood that there's a lot of capabilities and we wanted to help make it clear for customers to understand what capabilities exist and what the benefits and value of them are. So we've consolidated all of our IGA focused uh, features to one common page for all licensing around IG capabilities. So that is the, the, the doc I'm showing you here. And we have a nice uh, table right, where you can look and see what capability, you can click on each capable feature and see what it actually does and what license SKU you already have. So as you can see, there's a lot of capabilities in P1, right, we call this kind of foundational, some are even free, right, P2 brought us some of our basic entitlement management, basic access reviews, but then we brought into things like Entra ID governance, really started adding a lot of these new capabilities around logic apps, extensibility, um, the ability to do insights and drive ML actions in the environment that we think really scales governance. So I really hope um, this table really makes it clear on all the capabilities and where you, the value is. You could have made that one a lot easier if you didn't have the last one in the right, the new one. If you just stuck, stick to P, P1 one. and P2. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will tell you though, um, customers like that there's an entry ID, and, and maybe that you're going to say, hey, Jeff, you got to be crazy. But they like that there's a, a, a core focus on identity governance because they see this as um, they didn't know Entra had identity governance before. And now when they see their capabilities in this queue, they can compare to other solutions and see, hey, yeah, they may be managing where I'm coming from. But Microsoft Entra is where I'm going to. And they're bringing I, those I'd probably argue that um, quite a lot of people didn't realize that Azure AD was an identity provider at all. It was just like this extension. And yes. I think that's a, a good thing uh, of the, the rename to Entra because it's kind of reinforcing, hey, this is an IDP. Like it's more than just syncing your on-prem um, and uh, there's no need to go and shell out a bunch of money, extra money uh, for solutions like Okta and yeah the other third party providers. I remember when we first announced the entry name, I actually happened to be at uh, an, uh, uh, one of the large identity focused conventions or conferences, right? And I actually was doing at the booth meeting customers and they were like, whoa, what is this entry thing? Like, well, it's formally, you know, you know, it as Azure Active Directory, but they saw it as something new and they wanted to learn about it. And then when they learned about it, they would say, well, I just talked to this other uh, vendor over here. They said I needed it, but it sounds like I already have it. I'm like, exactly, right? It's awareness of the capabilities of what you actually can use, and we want you to use them. And as you use them, you may discover there's more capabilities you also want to use too. And the next the next thing, Jeff, if I wanted to get better at doing intra-ID governance, where should I go and and, and get some help? Great question. So I highly recommend if you have not um, gone down the certification route. So we have a lot of information on the learn.microsoft.com, specifically the SC300. There are several learning paths there that walk through the capabilities that prepare you for the overall SC300 um, uh, exam. Highly recommend it to do that. But my team also has said, there's a lot of training and understanding of the technical capabilities uh, that you want to learn. So we actually published Microsoft Entry ID governance training out on GitHub for everybody to go and see. So we actually provided, you could see some of the resources here, where we walk through with the capabilities. And we learned that many organizations are focused on scenarios. So we've taken those features. We've built scenarios of how you can deploy POs, them as proof of POs concept in, in your environment. Okay. 
POC in a box, exactly. So we want to give you the capability, enable those trials of the capabilities. You'd be surprised um, how easy it is to enable them and then utilize these resources to go hands-on and deploy these and get experience and see the, the real value and give us feedback, right? We're always looking. That's, that's the beauty of the role I get to be in. I get to hear what works well, what doesn't work well, and thinks of how we can help improve products. So I, always I feel, feel like you're putting up to scenarios because scenarios is the best way of learning, right? Exactly. Yeah. Features enable scenarios. Scenarios enable the business outcomes we want. Absolutely. I mean, it, from a from a kind of wider picture, um, something that I uh, I've spoken about a lot, um, and I see is this um, siloing of teams. So. I don't know, te 10 years ago, you'd have an IT team and everyone like had their roles within it, but it was just IT. Um, and now there's a security team and, and an infrastructure team and a network team and an end user compute team. And they're all working in silos and that causes so many problems um, because uh, you're usually working towards the same strategic goal, but like op opposite ends or, or potentially, you know, the network team has got their own idea and they're just going to go and do whatever they like and expect everybody else to follow behind. Or maybe it's a security team. I realize what room I'm in here. Um, but uh, the, it, that causes a lot of friction. Um, but from a, um, I'm obviously coming at it from a, a device perspective, but somebody who might have Intune admin um, by the nature of their role uh, needs to use groups, needs to, um, uh, you know, have users that are a member of those groups. And it's it's very difficult to have a high level view over, um, you know, what those group, groups are doing, not only within the enter and identity space, but if those groups are being reused elsewhere, um, that kind of butterfly effect that can happen um, from one change could, could have significant ramifications, can't get that word out, ramifications. Um, I mean, the, the governance stuff, can that help um, kind of bridge that gap and provide a, a view of that kind of end-to-end -end, uh, impact of those sorts of changes? Or is that still something that's difficult to... So so today, right, if you're doing with governance, you're managing the assignments, right? But you still have the same challenge of groups, like I said, right? I added you to the group for this function. Somebody reused the group over there. We have heard there are ways for you to go and inventory your organization to try to find where those groups are being used. But this is typically a very complicated task for many organizations. One of the things we set out with in Enter ID governance were the those key tenets, right? Automation insights. I think giving you the ability to discover where access is assigned, how it's being used would be a great insight to see uh, yeah. made available to customers. <laughs> have all of us instead. That's great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Restream. Yeah. So, so Jeff, I, I have to say that thank you for uh, coming on here and, and talking about the IGA for uh, 43 minutes. Is there anything, Eric and some rest you guys want to <laughs> want to ask Jeff? I have one question. I'm going to end it with. I mean, it, it's it's a bit broad, I, I suppose. Um, you know, I think you've you've answered a lot of it within here, Jeff. But uh, I'm, I'm curious what you you may hear from organizations you talk to where. Uh, but I, I tend to see outside of the Microsoft world, people say that enter identity governance is like great if you're a Microsoft shop, but if you're like not, right, you need something else. And I, I suppose I, I, you're wondering what your sort of like rebuttal to that that statement might be. So it's not so much a rebuttal, but it's an, how do I inform yeah. them of what we actually can do today? So today, Customers may say, well, Microsoft, you don't do IGA. You don't do governance. We do. Oh, but you only do it for Microsoft services. No, you can bring any application, Microsoft, third party, line of business into Entra, right? And manage it from governance. But when I say into Entra, what do I mean? They usually typically mean SSO. Everybody's modernizing the authentication of apps. 
where they haven't so much focused on the authorization of apps. And today we support the ability to bring authorization assignments from on-premises apps to be managed from Entra. And it's a suite of capabilities, right? So you have your database app on-prem, you have your uh, LDAP app on-prem, your web services app. We have a lightweight agent right, that has a connector that speaks LDAP, that speaks web services. Now we've integrated that to Entra for provisioning. So now when I rep, uh, represent that app in Entra for authorization, I manage the assignment. When I'm assigned, I provision to that application. When I remove the assignment, I deprovision from that application. Or if I update attributes, I can flow those to the application. And the key thing here is that it's an app just like anything else, whether it's cloud, um, your cloud, someone else's cloud, or on-prem, you're managing it all the same. You don't have to have a separate tool for on-prem, a separate tool for cloud. You have a common control plane no matter where the app is. Good. And uh, Samesh, do you have our uh, a question for Jeff? Uh, not a question, but yes, we're, uh, especially regarding the levers and join us process, because working in a large enterprise, uh, uh, we have seen, like I've seen that in my, like in our own project, uh, mostly it's a scripted thing using service now or like MIM and FIM. But like this would be interesting to see how it evolves because it's a license cost wise also addition, which companies generally don't want to go away. Uh, but yes, this would be interesting to see and uh, understand challenges with it. Uh, it's a new thing, but interesting also to see how it goes. Yeah, we, we think that's a very key thing because when I talk to organizations, they have, I'll call a loose lever process. Somebody yeah. put the request into the IT some ticket to do, to do it. Maybe HR gave the signal, but they do it periodically to clean yeah. up the access, right? So there's a process but enacting that in a timely manner is not always the, the key thing. So using data to drive automation enables you to remove access, remove licenses, right, that you could reuse. But there's also the other scenario, the manual walkout. Everybody has that walkout scenario. When somebody, when Jeff leaves, because whatever reason, we have to go do these five things. What if you did four of them and you didn't do the fifth one? What's the result of that? So mm -hmm. having processes that you can trigger on the target and get visibility they were done completely and correctly yep, adds a lot of value. Things. So boarding process, manually we raise a ticket and like the person is leaving and suddenly or sometimes yep. a miss also, like that person left one day back or oh, still offboarding is yet to be done. So it's not 100% automated yet. And... Yeah, and, and we can trigger the automation from HR, right? HR data to call the ITSM ticket to go get the laptop, right? So we can do request physical things in the physical world from that identity there, data. There's too. an extension of that, which is what if you're uh, in an environment where you have multiple tenants, so you've got like a dev environment um, or, you know, maybe dev UAT, like you've got three, you, this um, identity might exist in those, like who's going and disabling those because that's an important part of that process as well, right? Exactly. And we've had customers who say, Jeff is leaving, um, disable Jeff's admin accounts in this tenant, disable Jeff's admin accounts, local admin accounts in other tenants. And because of that extensibility, right, we trigger on the person, we could take those custom tasks, go do those things in your environment. That's some great questions. And my question is going to be that so you're probably going to think it's about pass keys. It's not. It's not. It's going to be. So when do you <laughs> think that we are going to have the option to, so when we start a new tenant, no, th my question is, when are we going to go passwordless? So I see we have all the tools, passwordless. We have all the tools enable, to enable passwordless, but when do you see the environment adopting? Is it in 2020, 2020, 2020, 2024, 2025? When do you see like the, the majorities of, P, of attendance is now passwordless? Well, password list can mean on many different things. Starting the, we always call it a journey, right? I work with some very, very large global customers who are password list today. So it's not when is it happening? It's already happening. Each organization is choosing when they start that. We're, pass keys are exciting. They are almost here in public preview. I use them daily now, right? But 
uh, that doesn't mean you have to wait until one technology. It's that whole solution, right? How do I enable the authentication being passwordless? How do I provision a user to start up being passwordless? How do I recover in a world where there's no password reset anymore? These are all capabilities we built into Entra to enable a passwordless organization. So when you say when, today, start today, don't wait, right? Like if you're an organization who's using passwords, uh, maybe you're using MFA. If you haven't started using MFA yet, start going passwordless, right? It, it's it's one of the technologies that benefits security and benefits the end user, right? When I work with these organizations, they've deployed Widow's Hope for Business. They're not doing password resets anymore. They're not having to change them anymore. They're not getting prompted for MFA, right? They benefit from user experience and security and the organization benefits from that overall security. So I know that doesn't answer your question. When does everybody go passwordless? I hope to see this more and more, but it's accelerating. I think every customer I talk to has a plan to go past us today. That's great. And we're going to end on that. So thank you, everybody. To, to Thank you, everyone, to coming on the show. And yeah, see you next time. Cool. Thank Thanks you, Jeff. Well.